Welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. My name is Alec Cooley. Um, I am the senior advisor here with Bush Systems and I'll be your moderator. Your, the, I'll be one of your co-moderators for today's program. Um, this, is, this is part of Bush Systems Green Thinking webinar series. Uh, these are roughly uh, bi-monthly programs that we do. Um, and they're all focused in one form or another on waste or materials management, um, for the most part tied to, to institutional settings, uh, but that's not universal. Um, so these are programs we do all the time. We've got an archive that I'll talk more about at the end of the program on how you can uh, see some of our past programs. Today's program is focused on uh, advancing the circular economy in healthcare. Um, we're returning to this topic. Uh, some of you may remember we did in December of 2021, we did a similar program focused on healthcare. That one focused more broadly on, on the full range of ways that we can address waste in, in healthcare, uh, looking both at recycling, organics, um, as well as upstream solutions. With today's program, we're focusing very narrowly on those upstream um, and taking more of a deep dive to look at different ways that we can address waste um, uh, through reuse and reprocessing, um, specifically uh, areas, that, uh, solutions that get more at the circular economy um, um, side of things and how we how we improve programs um, uh, through the upstream. As anyone who's spent time in a hospital or any other healthcare facility knows, a significant amount of waste is generated in these facilities. Um, addressing them, whether through recovery or waste prevention, has always been a major challenge because of health and safety protocols, and as well as an ingrained culture um, that prioritizes convenience. But that's starting to change, which is exciting. Um, certainly for those, any of us who have been in this industry for a long time, we know that it's very difficult to push some of these. Um, and But we are starting to see some real substantial um, change in this. Um, it's, uh, a lot of this is being driven by the increasing focus on scope three uh, emissions, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that's creating pressure um, and as well as incentives for healthcare systems to find ways to address some of these systematic barriers that, that do uh, tend to lean towards single use. We're gonna be learning about some of this trend on today's program, as well as hear a couple of successful case study examples of how um, this is being done. So with that, let me introduce our panel for today's program. Uh, first, uh, we'll have uh, Erica Kimball, who is a CEO and principal with Kimball Sustainable Healthcare, a, a sustainability, a healthcare sustainability firm. Um, Erica, I, I'm really excited. She's partnering with this program. She's going to be uh, the, the curator and sort of the co-moderator for this program to help lead the conversation, um, as well as uh, start off with a with a um, with an advance uh, setting the stage presentation. After Erica, we will have Sarah Brockhaus as well as Victor Mitri, both from the UCLA Health System. And then our uh, third presentation will be from Lauren, uh, Lauren Koch, with, who is a sustainability program manager with the Ohio State University Wexter Medical Center. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about their background and bios um, as we go through. But before we, uh, before we jump in, um, just want to remind folks that you know, obviously, we're we've got everybody muted and cameras off, but we do want to make this as um, interactive as possible. So we we encourage folks, hey, if you have questions for our speakers, go ahead and put them into the Q and A function on the right side of your dashboard. If you just have comments or if you want to share some of your own experiences, which we we strongly encourage, we we love to see a good dialogue going on. Um, just be careful to to make the distinction to put those into the chat area separate from any questions that you actually want addressed by the, the uh, presenters, which need to go into that separate Q&A function. So with that, let's just jump right in. Um, and I'll start off by introducing Erica Kimball. And um, so Erica is, um, Excuse me. Erica is a healthcare sustainability leader with more than 15 years in the field. She is the founder and CEO of Kimple Sustainable Healthcare, a consulting firm that develops sustainability strategies, programs, and communications for hospitals and healthcare. Erica began her sustainability journey as a staff nurse leading volunteer waste reduction projects in clinical units. She now works to create solutions that improve environmental outcomes while supporting hospital quality, safety, and value. 
She is a certified True Zero Waste Advisor and knows that healthcare waste is a solvable problem. Erica holds an MBA from Presidio Graduate School and a BSN from the University of South Florida College of Nursing. And with that, let me hand it over to Erica. Good morning, Alec, and uh, good morning to everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just see if I can advance the screen. We can go ahead to the next slide. Um, as Alex said, uh, we're here today to talk about one of my favorite topics. We've got some really great panelists, so my goal is to keep my comments brief. I'm here to give you the 30,000 foot overview of the opportunity of the circular economy for healthcare. As Alex noted, uh, my name is Erica Kimball. I am the founder of Kimball Sustainable Healthcare. Uh, KSH builds sustainability solutions for hospitals and healthcare. We create strategies, programs, communications, and engagement to build sustainability and climate solutions in the healthcare industry. One of our core specialties, I'm happy to say, is building the circular economy for healthcare. Um, you know, as Alec noted, uh, I got my start in the business as a nurse driving waste reduction solutions on my healthcare unit. Uh, now it's really fun to be saying things like the circular economy and healthcare in the same sentence. To give a, the world's fastest definition of the circular economy, it's really making less waste by maximizing the useful life cycle of any product that you have in hand. Uh, this is the classic butterfly diagram from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. You can learn more about that online, but uh, really what this is, is a whole systems level roadmap for how we achieve those goals. Achieving the circular economy in healthcare, when we start to apply those principles inside the healthcare industry, we really start to get some really material benefits that align nicely with the goals of healthcare overall. The first thing that we do is we lower the carbon footprint of the healthcare industry. The scope three emissions, they include goods and services, and the less waste that you make, the lower your carbon footprint. When you implement these programs inside of a healthcare setting, you also save money. Less waste is less wasted money. And we have some really great uh, panelists today that can talk to the cost savings in their institutions. The one I'm really excited about really is we're starting to look at how many jobs we can create in the community when we do something better with supplies than throwing them in the garbage can after one use. Uh, you know, reuse, remanufacturing, those are local job creation tools. And healthcare can do good in the community by being good for the local economy. We know that it's a driver of health, and this is an exciting thing to think about as we take a second look at how we use supplies in the hospital. Last but not least, uh, a local uh, repair and reuse and you know, sending your supplies to the laundry down the street, um, that localizes your supply chain and it really does help navigate things like uh, the historic supply chain disruptions that we had over the past few years. Um, so what's the opportunity for the circular economy inside the healthcare industry? We have 5.9 million tons of opportunity to be somewhat exact. Uh, if you want to do the math for your own local community, on average, hospitals generate about 30 pounds of waste per patient day. 30% of that is more or less generated in the OR, but the majority of waste overall is generated in clinical areas. And so that includes places like inpatient care and outpatient clinics as well. Um, you do get your regular garden variety municipal waste in uh, you know, clinical areas, bottles and cans and coffee, pa coffee paper. But there's other, some, there's other high yield, high value items that we should really look at closely for opportunities to reduce waste. Things like are alternatives to single-use disposable to supplies and linens, um, really some great cost savings to be had by making sure that we're not wasting supplies unused. And um, another one that's, I think, a high yield priority is addressing clinical packaging through uh, emerging practices around extended producer responsibility. So how do you apply these principles inside of the healthcare industry? We all know the classic waste hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle. When you start to build out that reverse triangle inside the healthcare industry, you can add a few other ones like donate and reprocess. We'll talk about reprocessing today. Um, but there are three kind of keys to success in the circular economy. 
Number one is we need high value products. So we need to make and buy healthy and high value things. The second is you got to take care of those products. You need to make sure that those materials are really maintaining their highest, best use, again, through quality processing, careful handling, and, and making sure we're taking care. And then the third thing you need is you really need to formalize those processes to make sure they last. And you do that through things like policies and standards and guidelines. And we talked about the benefits of the circular economy to healthcare. I think this is where healthcare has something to offer the circular economy. Healthcare has really valuable stuff. Um, clinical grade materials mean something. Those materials are used by highly trained technicians, really in controlled areas. And healthcare operates based on policies and standard work. And we have some of the highest quality standards around. And so while the circular economy isn't necessarily easy inside the healthcare industry, I do think that healthcare can create a model for how the circular economy thrives at scale. Two initiatives that we're gonna look at today are reuse and reprocessing. These are uh, really promising and readily available uh, schemes to help, again, prevent wasting your institutions. Um, and so I wanna jump into the definitions just to set the stage um, for these initiatives. There is a little bit of technical overlap if you start to get into the weeds. And so for the purposes of today's webinar, Reusable products, those are like the durable products that are used in their complete form um, over and over again. These products you can get 70 uses, rule of thumb for linens, up to 200 plus uses for other items. And it could be anything from your food service wear outside of clinical areas to launderable linens that could be made single use disposable now, um, or things like patient positioners. Again, these could be cleaned internally inside your building or inside if you own your own laundry, for instance, or via third-party vendors. The second thing that we're talking about today is reprocessing. And again, for the purposes of this webinar, what we're talking about is a third-party reprocessing, um, and really it's a remanufacturing. This is an FDA-regulated process where a single-use disposable device is taken, taken apart, cleaned, reassembled um, and remanufactured as a new device. And so there's two buckets of these uh, devices, more or less, when you're thinking about these inside of a hospital, this might be helpful for folks who don't work in the hospital. Uh, Non-invasive non -invasive devices are things that maybe are worn on the patient or maybe are under the patient as a pad. Uh, these are things like EKG leads or your blood pressure cuff. If not reprocessed, these probably go in the hospital garbage can. Uh, invasive devices, these are your surgical tools. Uh, you can see a picture of uh, an example here. These are surgical devices, and more or less, if they're not reprocessed, they're probably going in your sharps bin. And so one important thing I want to talk about today is that there's two opportunities through reprocessing to reduce cost and environmental impact. First and foremost, no matter if your hospital wants to buy reprocessed or not, you can and should be getting these things out of the waste bin. You should, you can collect reprocessable devices. And again, it saves environmental impact and money. And now you're a part supplier for the circular economy. Uh, the second part of that, of course, if you wanna close that little circle is buy reprocessed. And you know, you're buying a lower carbon footprint, lower cost, more resource efficient supplies. Those are our definitions. And so quickly, I wanna go over some success factors for how you get started with these programs in a hospital setting. The first thing that you need to do is you need to build a team. Zero waste is a team sport. These initiatives are clinical process improvements in the healthcare setting. And so this is your clinical process improvement team. These are your friends to go make. If you are not a hospital and you wanna know how to engage these folks, see if there's a green team in your local hospital that you can engage with. The second thing is you gotta make a case. Healthcare is an evidence-based institution and we operate based on data. There's a lot of great data to be had in these initiatives. And so you wanna look at your comparative numbers, your comparative use, and then the requisite business case, the environmental case, and of course the clinical case clinical case, working with that um, very important team of stakeholders. Last but not least, 
This is some of my favorite work. It's really, uh, you're getting into a long-term relationship with your stuff. And so you have to make a plan for this program to last. You want it to last for a long time. And the way you do that is through active quality management. This is where zero waste best practices and healthcare quality improvement practices, they hold hands. We all know this keys to a high quality zero waste program. You have to have the right bin and signage, the right process with roles and responsibilities. You gotta make sure that everybody knows um, their role. And very importantly, make sure that you're including these programs in your quality audits. That's how we know that we're in this for the long term together. Last thing I want to say before we introduce our panelists is that um, you might hear that we're going back to reprocessing or we're going back to reusables. Healthcare doesn't really go back to anything. We go forward. And so what I'd like for this to be is the start of what is reprocessing 2.0 look like? What does the new reuse economy look like? And I think it looks like designing our medical devices so that they can be reprocessed a lot of times. And so that we continue to um, improve performance and patient care outcomes, as well as improving the environmental uh, you know, impact of the processes that keep those things clean. And when we do that together, we really are helping to fulfill the promise of the circular economy to drive health in our local communities. So that concludes my 30,000 foot view. And with that, uh, I would love to introduce the UCLA team uh, to, uh, I'm gonna stop trying to steer. I'd love to introduce the UCLA team uh, to uh, give their presentation. So let me give an intro here. Uh, joining us on the call is Sarah Brockhouse. And Sarah is the Sustainability Program Manager for the University of California, Los Angeles Health System. In her role, she oversees the system's sustainability policies and programming efforts, including facilitation of topical working groups and initiatives, implementation of policies and procedures, and creation of data collection avenues and reporting. Sarah holds an undergraduate degree in construction science from the University of Oklahoma and a JD MBA from Oklahoma City University. She's a proud alumna of UCLA Extension Sustainability Certificate Program and is a lead green associate. Joining Sarah is Victor Mitri, who is the Assistant Director of Logistics Materials Management for the UCLA system, where he's worked for the last 16 years. His responsibilities include operational and staff administrative support, budget and finance oversight, policy and procedures, service expansion planning and regulatory compliance, supply chain management, receiving and laundry and linen services. Mr. Mitri holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration. Welcome, Sarah and Victor. Thank you, Erica, for that introduction and to our hosts for allowing us to join today and our attendees. Um, as Eric mentioned, I'm Sarah Brockhouse, um, Sustainability Programs Manager with UCLA Health, and I'm joined by Victor Mitri, uh, one of our sustainability champions. Um, at UCLA Health, and he's going to be sharing about our reusable isolation gowns initiatives, and I'll be providing a few introductory comments today. Um, so just to provide a very high-level overview of our health system, um, our health system comprises of four hospitals with another under construction, a community clinic network of a, almost 300 clinics, and around 34,000 employees. Um, and we're fortunate at UCLA Health to have um, three full-time sustainability professionals on our team. Um, but I just like to emphasize that with an organization of our size, we really rely on our subject matter experts throughout the organization, our clinical champions and leads uh, to advance our sustainability initiatives and programming. And so it's really an organization and a health system wide effort to advance sustainability. Um, and going a, a little bit into our why, um, kind of the grounding principles that advance our work, um, as Erica mentioned, we're acutely aware of healthcare's impact on the environment um, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, environmental pollutants and the adverse health impacts that has on our patient populations, particularly our most vulnerable and marginalized communities. And so that is really the grounding driving force in our work at UCLA Health. Um, we also are fortunate to have a sustainable practices policy that's promulgated by the University of California, which our academic medical centers and our um, institutions of higher ed 
um, all fall within. And so that policy um, provides the structural uh, framework for uh, advancing waste reduction in our health system. Um, it really prioritizes uh, reducing the waste that's coming into our system first, uh, and then evaluating reusability of products, uh, and then uh, evaluating recycling uh, where the first two are not an option. Um, we also have uh, recently um, incorporated uh, elements of our policy to prioritize reprocessing. So that is tremendously helpful in advancing reprocessing programs, um, including incorporating reprocessing language or language that's favorable to reprocessing uh, in our health system contracts. Um, we're targeting uh, 25 pounds of total waste per adjusted patient day by 2025 and 20 pounds of uh, total waste by adjust, per, per adjusted patient day by 2030. And so we feel those are pretty ambitious goals um, to track towards uh, for our health system. Um, and the reusable isolation gowns initiative has been tremendous in um, advancing us towards that goal um, and is also um, kind of a process and structure that we are taking in other initiatives that we're working to implement at UCLA Health. And so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Victor Mitri to highlight uh, the um, implementation of our reusable isolation gowns. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, uh, West Coast, and good afternoon, East Coast. Thank you for allowing us to speak with you today. Um, we'll go over this fairly quickly. Uh, we had an issue at UCLA Health with our uh, disposable isolation gowns. So I'll give you a little background. You know, with disposable um, gowns, you have different types and, you know, they're made out of paper or pulp uh, for low repellency. Uh, they can be spun uh, polyester for medium repellency and they can be treated with laminate or plastic film to be fluid resistant. Uh, they're single use, they're cheap to manufacture. Uh, they're not durable, they're more sustainable susceptible to snags and rips. Uh, each gown creates solid waste. And really at UCLA, we didn't have any recycling or reprocess reprocessing program uh, in existence at that time. So UCLA Health uh, was purchasing 2.6 million disposable gowns annually uh, prior to the transition to reusable. And uh, we were sending over 234 tons to the landfill. And the biggest problem for us besides that is that there was growing. And we wanted to figure out a way to slow it down. So we, we decided that we're going to go ahead and uh, look at reusable. Uh, we started our program by inviting uh, several vendors. I believe uh, four vendors. We invited them to come and show us their product, give us their specs, uh, tell us about their benefits, best practices, cost, and uh, the AAMI uh, standards for barrier protection. Um, you have level one through four, and uh, the fourth level is obviously if you're doing some open heart surgical cardiac uh, cardiac uh, case, which this isn't what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, isolation gowns for standard uh, precaution. So you're looking at a level one or two. Um, and then we once we got our samples and our uh, data and our uh, uh, homework done, we go ahead and we went ahead and created a subcommittee and formed, you know, formed a subcommittee to evaluate the products and see which way we're going to go. Uh, obviously, your stakeholders, yeah, your infection prevention, uh, nursing leadership, caregivers, uh, sustainability, um, presentation, environmental services, laundry processing plant. It depends on whether you do your own uh, laundry or you actually have contracted out and uh, materials management. Um, so we got a subcommittee rolling and we started um, evaluating all the products that were given to us. Um, we, we evaluated also, which sounded easy now, but it was fairly complicated. And how are you going to you know, fold the product? It's very slippery. How are you going to bundle them? Are you going to wash and dry uh, requirements? How is the plant going to deal with you know, over drying and burning this product? So they, you, you have to meet with your plant, uh, laundry plant to figure out, can they handle this product? Uh, the overall cost. Um, how are you going to um, supply your units? You know, I, we looked at all the avenues of how to present these um, reusable isolation gowns at the unit level. Believe it or not, there. I mean, there's different ways of uh, presenting this, and you can hang these tubes, and um, they just pull them out from the tubes. And there's tons of ways to uh, have these available for the caregivers. And uh, once we had all our homework done and our subcommittee started and we're rolling on, on what we're gonna do, we wanted to hit this 
like with the highest level. So we looked at, you know, which unit was our highest user of um, disposable gowns. And at that time, it was one of our uh, liver transplant units. So we decided, okay, we're going to go. And if we're successful there, then we should have all the issues uh, ironed out. And um, we, we, we went to that unit. We did a lot of education. We met with the caregivers and the nursing staff, and we explained to them why we want to do this. And we're looking for some of their feedback. Um, we also created a short survey that was going to go hand in hand with starting this pilot. And we decided we're going to do the liver transplant, and then we'll do uh, one in PEDS and one in uh, med, med surge area, and then one in the ICUs. And we gather all our data. And from there, we figure out the product that we want to adapt. Um, initial feedback and responses. You know, you're always going to have criticism at the beginning because people, they don't like change. Uh, and um, we were told disposables are easier to remove uh, because they can just tear them right off uh, without any problems. Um, the initial um, reusable isolation gowns had, were, had the ties, so it was very difficult to remove. And so we, we noticed that they also said washables are slippery, and they are slippery. Uh, washables are too hot, they're a little hot. Um, so we figured, okay, we'll look at those um, feedbacks and we'll try to fix them. We'll also try to help them with, you know, how to be supportive and accept this. So you always want to have a sustainability uh, person in the unit to try to help them out. Like, hey, this is the right thing to do. You're going to get better protection. This will help the environment and availability. Uh, we worked with uh, nursing, with infection prevention, and of course, um, cost savings at the end. Cost savings wasn't our um, initial target. We were really trying to reduce our uh, footprint, carbon footprint. And of course, uh, with us, we actually contract our laundry out to laundry plants. So we met with our laundry plant to make sure that they can handle the product. Uh, just for your information, you know, we want to make sure that they're in California, they're HLAX accreditation and uh, hygienically clean healthcare certification. So we looked at their certification. We also looked at the whole product, which is once we're done with this product and if it's successful, what are we going to do with it? So end of life, how, what are you going to do with the end of life? So that's another issue that you need to deal with. Um, and I'll let you, um, we also had some uh, controversy over, well, you know what, you're presenting this uh, product and you're also causing, you know, uh, a carbon footprint. And uh, we said, no, we looked at the studies and, um, you know, the studies that we looked at all evaluated that you have a um, less energy, um, less water, and uh, you're, you're doing um, less um, carbon footprint with the reusable overall. So, because they will come and say, well, you know, you're, you're going to cause harm to the environment by producing this product. All right. So here's what we decided. After all the gathering, all the information and uh, all the surveys, we came up with the decision that we're not going to be able to use off the shelves isolation gowns. Our staff don't like them. The, they're not happy with them. And we decided, okay, for, uh, for UCLA Health, we're going to just go ahead and make it easy for everybody. So we're going to mimic the disposable gowns. So what we decided to do is make them custom made. And believe it or not, in California, it gets cold every once in a while. So we noticed right away, if it's 100% uh, polyester, we had a little problem with static. So we decided to have it, have our custom made gowns made out of 99% tightly, wo tightly woven micro linear polyester fluid resistant fabric. We added a 1% carbon fiber, which helps prevent the static uh, electricity uh, that builds up in polyester material. And it does really work. Uh, we also decided, hey, you know what? We have in California what's called the lift team to help our patients uh, move. And uh, um, our lift team tends to be on the larger side. So we wanted to have uh, two sizes. So we did a one size fits all and then a 3X uh, large size for uh, the larger population of our caregivers. We also didn't uh, like the... The cups protection, we tested them and we weren't that happy with the protection we're getting. We At UCLA, we use what's called a double glove, one under and one over. So we wanted to make sure that the gloves will cover the cuffs. So we created our uh, cuffs shorter and uh, we increased our sleeve length. So you get the full coverage and better protection. And we decided to go with snaps. So basically you're gonna be able to just snap them off and that will kind of mimic how you take off the disposable. And then we also had a problem where the Caregivers, when they take off the gowns, they had them inside out. And then the plant was complaining like, hey, you know, this is causing a problem for us. So then we decided to make them reversible. 
So our gowns are reversible. You can put them anyway, and they'll be fine. Uh, each way you put them on or take them off. Um, there is a grid on the bottom of um, the gowns, at, and you're supposed to mark uh, each time you use it. I find it useless. Um, they do print them on all our gowns. It, it's hard to believe that somebody who's going to sit there and actually mark every time a gown is used. Um, and what I'm looking for really in, in the near future is to do some, an RFID technology, and that will just get rid of this whole thing. And we, I can uh, I can go ahead and focus on how many times these guns have been used. Right now, we have a, a multi-stage um, visual inspection. So we rely on just visual inspections for the um, the quality of the gown. A gown, but I'd like to see that and go to an RFID in the future. The average cost for us was about seven to ten dollars, depending on the size. And we just for your information, we decided to do two vendors uh, when we started because you want to have a backup vendor. So we contracted out with two different vendors with the same product, custom made. And um, I'll show you if you can see the red is where we started out with the disposable, and the blue is where we started with the reusable. And as we reduced the disposable, we increased uh, our reusable, obviously. And um, we started in May of 2012, and we went very slow, one unit at a time. And once the unit was uh, converted, we don't go back. So we, we did it very slow, and uh, we made sure that we had inf enough inventory and production in our uh, pipeline from our two vendors. And uh, by January of 2014, we had the Reagan campus converted. And by the way, when he did one campus at a time, and then uh, we were also working with the IP uh, committee to see if they can reevaluate the isolation protocol. And in 2014, they actually changed their uh, protocol and they removed the MRC and the VRE uh, from uh, isolation protocol. And that really helped us out. It reduced uh, like 45% of our need just right there. Um, then we focus on doing our Santa Monica campus. And um, we, as you can see, we actually brought our reuse, um, disposable down to almost nothing. Our reusable was right on uh, target. And I will show you what happened with our pandemic. Nobody expected the pandemic. So we did have a huge blip, blip on our pandemic for usage. We went from an average of about 130,000 to about 250,000 uh, per month. And um, we also ended up using some uh, disposable at that time. By the way, we always kept a, a disposable uh, inventory uh, just in case we ever have an emergency. Um, and so you may want to keep a disposable um, backup. And as you can see, we had two blip blips. And um, as of today, we are actually using very little disposable and everything is on reusable. Just a, a quick reminder that um, when you have, uh, we actually found out that when we use the word reusable, we had some confusion with our caregivers and they, um, we, we wanted to clarify, reusable doesn't mean that you, you can keep reusing the same product. So we had to change the name to single use washable isolation gowns, um, just to clar clarify the confusion. So overall, overall total program benefits, significant environmental benefits and cost savings. We've issued over 14 million washable isolation gowns uh, since May of 2012. That's 14 million plus uh, single-use gowns diverted from landfill. Conversion reduced our gowns from 2.6 to 1.3 million. And that's a 50% reduction. And here's what, what we discovered, that when we have the reusable um, isolation gowns, the staff intended to use less. And um, not that they used less, they actually had less waste. So. Um, we had a, a reduction in the usage and then, of course, the IP reclassification uh, for the MRSE and VRE standard. And conversion uh, reduced cost savings from 1.6 million annually, and that was growing to about half a million for usable. Um, 1.1 1, 1 million initial savings from our rollout program from 2012 2015. And of course, I've already mentioned the 2014 IP update. Um, that really, really helped us. Total uh, program uh, savings as of today is 4 million. It was going higher and we're not getting as much uh, savings as we were in the past after the pandemic, everything's gone up, prices have increased all over, but we are averaging about $450,000 annually in savings. And of course the biggest uh, thing that came out of this 
for us during, during the pandemic was resiliency. We were one of the few health systems that we were able to keep our uh, caregivers safe. We had product available. We just had to wash them faster and turn them over. And uh, we kept that going. As of today, uh, the reusableization gowns is part of our system. Uh, the cost is 50% less uh, than disposable. Uh, they're customized for our caregivers' needs and the way they wanted them. They meet the industry standard for infection protection. Um, they last 75 to 100 washes. And of course, they uh, use less energy, water, and waste. Uh, and um, the cost savings is about 450000 per year. And it's an in uninterrupted protection with resiliency. And I will move this over now to Sarah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Victor. And so in conclusion, we just wanted to reiterate, um, as Victor mentioned, that the COVID pandemic really highlighted supply chain vulnerabilities and, emphas and emphasized for us the connection and interconnection between climate and the environment, emergency preparedness planning, and supply chain. And so um, several of the initiatives that we've been identifying really are tied back to our resiliency planning and thinking through how the continued impacts of, uh, of climate change um, will see an increased instance of infectious diseases, um, emergencies associated with climate harms, how is our supply chain um, going to be impacted and how can we um, add that as, a, as, a, as an additional um, a way to advance sustainability initiatives. So um, thank you all for your time and um, appreciate the opportunity to, to share about this initiative today. Great. Thank you, Sarah and Victor. That was fantastic. Um, we're gonna do a quick live poll and then I'll hand it back over to Erica. Um, but just to get a sense of who's in the room, um, here's a question. You'll see this pop up in your screen in a moment. Uh, what practices are you seeing gain traction at facilities you work with? And, and understanding that uh, I know many of the attendees, you may not work directly with a, with a healthcare system, but you may be a consultant or you may be a local government that consults with healthcare. So you, we can interpret this question broadly if, um, it's, if you have some sort of relationship and, and based on your knowledge of what's in place. And if, if this doesn't apply to you, obviously just, just go ahead and, and ignore it. Um, but um, Erica, do you have a, you want to throw a question for our attendees? Sure. Um, I, the UCLA initiative was first posed as an environmental initiative. And so I was wondering when you're making the environmental case to your healthcare peers, really, how are the ways that you communicate those environmental benefits? Thanks, Erica. Um, so in, in terms of communicating environmental benefits, um, as you mentioned in your introductory comments, I think making de data-driven decisions is, is crucially important for us. And it's often the first questions that clinicians ask um, when they're considering um, a, an initiative. So for us, um, you know, we really focus on the, that tripart um, pillar of sustainability, which is uh, people, planet, and profit. So we're looking at, you know, how are how are decisions going to impact our environment? Um, how are they going to impact our patient populations? And and ensure that the sustainability decision um, doesn't affect our ability to provide excellent um, and quality care. Um, and then, um, and then, obviously, infection prevention is always a consideration. Uh, but then, we always want to. We also want to be able to make the environmental and cost savings argument. So, fortunately, um, a lot of the initiatives that we're looking at, especially with related to waste reduction, reusability, and reprocessing, often have significant environmental and cost savings. Excellent. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Alec. Great. Um, if we can pull up the results of this poll so we can just all get a sense of um, what we're hearing. So um looks like we have, uh, you know, probably the, the, the single biggest area is, is food service reusable containers um, from cafeterias and others and, and patient rooms. So that, that makes sense. That's certainly low-hanging fruit that uh, a lot of institutions are working on now, not just healthcare, um, but um, looks like reusable medical products. 49% single-use device reprocessing, 32 or the other runner-ups. Um, um, I think it's interesting with the OR kit reformulation. That's what I would, I actually would have expected more if somebody's from outside of the industry, but um, um, this is a good background to have. Good. good. I'll hand it back over to you, Erica. 
Great. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Lauren Cook, who's joining us um, from the Ohio State University. Lex, Lex, let me say that again, the Ohio State University uh, Wexner Medical Center. Lauren is a sustainability program manager, and she brings over 15 years of healthcare and sustainability experience to the field. Seven of those were, were spent working with Practice Green Health. During her time working there, she led uh, authorship of multiple toolkits, such as the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Toolkit. Lauren participates in national sustainability industry groups, including the U.S. Healthcare Climate Council, the Healthcare Plastics Recycling Council's Hospital Advisory Board, and the American Society of Healthcare Engineers Sustainability Task Force. Lauren has a double master's degree in environment and natural resources and public policy from The Ohio State University. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Erica, and thank you so much for the invitation to present today. And don't worry, our name is a mouthful. That happens very frequently to everyone. Um, and I'm just so excited to, to share our story, but really to be hearing um, other stories. Victor and Sarah, I can't wait to share this slide deck with um, my supply chain folks who are working on a washable isolations, uh, isolation gown initiative as we speak. And Erica, I really appreciate that you continue to remind us that um, single-use device reprocessing, which is what we're going to talk about today, is part of the healthcare circular economy. And that's not always framing or verbiage that I use. And so I really appreciate that reminder. And I hope others are taking away their own good nuggets from these stories. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we are an academic medical center with seven hospitals. Most of those kind of cram together as we like to do at academic medical centers and then one offsite community hospital. Um, but we have 100 plus facilities and continuing to expand and build across central Ohio uh, and represent 1500 beds in our area. So our sustainability work Really, we see it as kind of the foundational pillar to all of our strategic plan pillars. So we try and orient and organize our work around talent and culture, research, education, world-class care, operational excellence, which much of this fits into, and newly, um, health equity, which is an exciting emerging space that we're working on. But for us, since we're attached to a university, we actually work towards the same North Star goals as our university. Um, so carbon neutrality by 2050, energy and waste reduction, water reduction, looking towards locally sourced food, um, reducing our fleet, and then environmentally preferable products. Um, so all of this, I think Sarah mentioned it as well, uh, you know, I'm a generalist that kind of hops around in all of these areas. Um, unfortunately, my uh, supply chain value analysis counterpart, who I really wanted to give this story and case study wasn't available today, but I'm here hopefully representing her, but we can't do this work without all of our partners across the health system, right? I'm a team of one plus some interns um, and it's a lot of work to do. So I think, what we like to show is the breadth across our health system and, and just how it kind of goes, all these sustainability initiatives go into every corner. Um, so it's everything from, you know, four and a half percent energy reduction. Um, we're looking at anesthesia gases and continuing to reduce those um, in our diversion of waste. And we even love to highlight uh, the waste associated with reduction specifically related to the program we're gonna talk about today. And that's where my role primarily comes in, right? How do I support this program um, to help the collections and diversion of our waste? And as many people in the healthcare sustainability field know, getting that waste diversion number to continue to tick up means lots of programs, which is what this slide is meant to represent. So single use device reprocessing is really just one of the many, and we continue to add each year. But at the end of the day, this started, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it um, as I share the story, this started and, and continues to live in supply chain. This is truly part of a sustainable procurement strategy. So uh, the 
first things that we did uh, as we started this work was, okay, well, let's look at some sustainable procurement guidelines. Let's start to think about through the lens of our RFP and our contracts, how we can source more environmentally preferable products that offer take back programs. And then of course this image, which I should have cited um, in reference to practice green health, gives us a great bird's eye view of what are all the cost savings opportunities that exist in the ORs. And I'm proud to say we're doing all of these um, but reprocessing is something we've been doing for a long time. Um, and that's kind of across the board. You know, we saw 30% of today's respondents have some type of program. But uh, when we look at practice green health, which about 400 hospitals annually submit data um, across the country. And this is really hard to see, but essentially what this is saying is of those that submit a practice green health application, and that's just about 10% of, of hospitals represented there, 82% are participating in some way with a, re, a single use device reprocess medical, uh, medical device reprocessing program. And so we, we've, we're still on the surface though, I think it is what I wanna say, um, even at OSU, we still have a lot of room for improvement and I know the industry does as well. So for us, this started much longer than um, even when the sustainability program existed. We have a 12-year partnership now with Stryker Sustainable Solutions, and this truly was driven out of supply chain as a cost savings initiative. Um, we continue every month to meet with our vendor. We do a monthly business review. We look for opportunities. We have an on-site presence, an FTE dedicated that's doing collections across our facility. I should say facilities uh, uh, as we continue to expand. Um, and, and that has really helped continue a consistent um, progress with our program. So what does this mean? So beyond the collections, you know, the, why is Stryker doing this? Why are other companies doing this? Well, we're collecting the material for them to recreate something, as Erica described, an FDA approved process. There's a quality check on every single piece of equipment, but this equipment can be used. And, and each piece of equipment has a different lifespan that is designated through the FDA. Some can be used four times, some can be used 20 times, but that goes through an extremely rigorous process and then an extremely rigorous process at the cleaning facility where it's all disassembled, sterilized, put back together, quality check, securely packaged, and then shipped back to someone else to use it for an extremely discounted rate. And that's, of course, where the cost savings come from. So for us, we're doing primarily non-invasive um, items like pulse oximeter sensors, um, EP cables and catheters, and then ultrasonic scalpels. Uh, and for us, every year that ends up garnering about a million dollars in savings. So you can see just a quick snapshot of this is the type of data that we review on a monthly basis with our multidisciplinary stakeholder team. So we've got people from supply chain, I sit on that group, um, and then we have a couple clinical folks that look at you know, one, where are there opportunities to buy more reprocessed items? And then two, how I really support the program is how do we improve our collections, right? Do we need to do an additional in-service at this particular OR because we've had a high turnover or we're just, you know, our on-site FTE is able to look and see we're starting to get contamination in there. But I would still say we have a lot of room for growth. And so for us personally, what have been some of the barriers? Um, we've migrated systems. So anytime a health system is looking at a new ordering system, that can really um, mess with the system in place. And so we've had to do a lot of work to repair that and make sure that our reprocessed medical devices are um, one of the first options selected and available and ready to be used. Uh, as every healthcare system is facing, staff turnover continues to be a barrier that ongoing education is necessary, um, both from a purchasing perspective, but more so from a collections perspective. And then 
we sometimes run into the issue of not having enough clinical support, so vocal support. I think when I first stepped into this role, I really felt like supply chain was driving it. But what I've realized over the last four years is it's really being driven um, from clinical preference. And sometimes that leads into the fourth barrier. Sometimes that's a result of vendor misinformation. So I can't tell you the amount of calls that I've participated in. You know, this vendor told me the reason that this product failed was because it was reprocessed. And we have to work through that and really do some education. Um, but sometimes it feels like we're always fighting that uphill battle. And speaking of uphill battle, I think this is the hardest one that, that we're looking towards our next fiscal year to try and tackle, which is looking at a contracting roadmap and saying, okay, which contracts specify we can only buy X percentage reprocessed? How and when can we renegotiate that? And what's the right mix to both find that optimal cost savings, you know, have a reduction in emissions, um, and have supply chain resiliency. So I think that's the next piece where if we want to continue to optimize with our reprocessed buyback, um, that contract timelines and the handcuffs that often come with the contract negotiations is going to be a great opportunity for us. But overall, you can see the 12 years of partnerships is over 12 million in savings, a tremendous amount of um waste that has been diverted from the landfill. And then I, I think it's worth mentioning this, along with a lot of the other sustainable procurement work that we're doing, um, led us to be selected in the circles of excellence to the top 10 hospital applications for sustainable procurement last year. And I'm going to try and wrap it up so we can take a few questions. So thank you so much again, um, and happy to take questions now or offline. Great. Thank you, Lauren. That was wonderful. Um, we definitely have a lot of questions and, and there's been some great dialogue going on. Um, let's um, let's let's take up our second live poll and then then I'll again hand it back over to Erica to, to start off with the question. But um, again, if we can pull this up for the screen, um, this question is, uh, what would you judge to be the number one barrier to advancing reuse and reprocessing at facilities you work with? And again, think of this expansively. If, if you work as a consultant or or indirectly with specific facilities, you can sort of represent this in general terms. Um, and and obviously there are there are more options that we could list here, but uh, but I do encourage folks use that use the um, the chat if there are examples that don't conform with some of these options or just in general some stories. We'd love to, to see folks sharing examples of what you're doing in um, in the chat. Go with this. Um, Erica, let me hand it over to you. Yeah, Lauren, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Um, it was really nice to hear about the program. So the program at uh, Wexner uh, Medical Center has been in, you know, has now a, a great history behind it. If you were trying to launch a brand new reprocessing program in a hospital, What's your 30 second elevator pitch uh, when you get on the elevator with the with the executive in charge? Yeah, I mean, I think it still starts with cost savings. This is one of those um, rare opportunities where it's truly a win win situation and we're just leaving money on the table for not participating in this. Additionally, it's really visible, and that is often not true with sustainability initiatives. So it's a way to engage clinicians and show them that we're doing something that is reducing our impact on the environment. Um, so I think, you know, the, the proven cost savings, the visibility um, and the ability to really decrease our emissions and decrease waste is just, it's a no brainer. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, Alec, do you want to kick it off with questions or do you want me to? Uh, let's, let's pull up and just look at the responses to this first live oh, poll yeah. or the, this live poll quick. Um, so it looks like um, in terms of some of the barriers, uh, not surprisingly, misperceptions is showing up here. So yeah, you know, we've made the distinction between you know costs or actual costs because perceptions oftentimes is part of this. And I think probably also with the resistance from medical staff, both of these kind of point to some of the what you're referring to, Laura, Lauren, um, 
So I, I think it's interesting to see that uh, reinforced here. Um, so we can go ahead and turn this off then. Um, and yeah, so we'll go ahead and let me turn off the screen share in. Um, Erica, why don't you kick things off? I know you had some some advanced questions that you had, and then um, I'll, I'll I'll cite some of the questions coming into the into the dashboard. X, absolutely. So uh, one question, maybe for the UCLA team, but also for Lauren. Um, one thing that the UCLA team talked about was, um, you know, getting some initial questions about changing products. This is always change is hardest in healthcare, and so. If you can expand on your approach to gaining buy-in when you're launching these initiatives uh, with clinicians, that would be great. I can um, start, but I'll let Victor chime in too. I'd like to speak specifically maybe about the reusable isolation gowns or other initiatives, but I think um, with clinician buy-in for us, I think it's really about the clinicians being the key team members and really helping lead and advance the initiative. So. Um, so that it's, you know, it might be us coming to them perhaps with an idea or a question, but really it's our clinical champions that are really advancing the work um, with our, our support, um, you know, and helping, helping to provide legwork and then the, the appropriate multidisciplinary team members in the room. So our procurement and materials management team, our um, uh, infection and pre infection prevention team is critical, uh, you know, to, to include and, and be in the room uh, throughout the process, um, even on, on our um, ongoing initiatives today. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. Um, we, just to add a couple items is, you know, you, know, you, you got to let them know that they're getting better protection. They're doing the right thing for the environment. And if, if you throw at them the saying, hey, this is a cost uh, reduction initiative, you're not going to get any buy ins I mean, they're not going to like, they're going to say, forget it, we're not going to do it. So you have to have the champion on the unit, uh, you know, on the floor. Uh, you have to have champion that will say, hey, we, we need to do this. You might have a few that are not going to support you, but then uh, you have to do your education and you got to do your meetings. And, and again, for me, it was a champion, the sustainability champion. Uh, doing the right thing for our kids and for the environment. It's a big sell. And nurses love to do the right thing if you just show it to them. And uh, the financial benefit was at the end. That wasn't really our focus. And it just happened that it, you can be financially viable and efficient and help do the right thing for the environment. Thank you. Victor, what you said is so important because Erica, I forgot to ask you, who am I in the elevator with, right? If it's a hospital administrator, then yes, we're talking cost savings. If it's clinicians, they don't want to hear that. Um, I think it's much more about here's a way for you to divert that waste. And that's the piece that I, I get so many complaints. It's so frustrating, um, the amount of waste that we throw away. So actually, it, in a lot of ways, for those champions, as Sarah pointed out, that's what I go to them. I have them be the front facing effort. Let me be the project manager behind the scenes. Let them really push this through. And that's been um, my formula for success, certainly. Alec, I know we're approaching time, so... Um... Yeah, we are. Um, a, a lot of the, the questions that have come in, um, have been answered directly in the, the Q and A. So, just in the interest of time, I, I'll, I'll pass over some of those. Um, what, what, a couple of questions that did come in, though, um, that have been addressed, but just for everybody's knowledge, in terms of where do you find some of this background data? You know, the science showing the the actual LCA, you know, the life cycle benefits uh, of using reuse versus um, uh, single use, and um, it's Lauren had put in into the chat. There, there is um, a website in here. Um, do you want to make uh, give a shout out for that, Lauren, where you can find some of these studies? Yeah, I'll just shout out back to my old organization, Practice Green Health. They're the ones when I went asking to them, they're like, you know, this exists, right? Said, no. Um, so that's a great updated website that posts. Um, relevant healthcare LCAs. But I also just go to practice green health and I say, hey, I've got these three scopes that they're trying to move to disposables. Do you already know of some research that can help me make the case against that, essentially? So there, I would say that website's great, but practice green health has been a, a huge supporter for this work. 
Excellent. Um, Erica, why don't, why don't we do another question on your end okay. and then and then we'll we'll wrap things up. Excellent. We talked a little bit about the role that policy plays in in really supporting these programs. Um, Lauren, you uh, you have a sustainable procurement policy. Can you talk about the way that you use policy to help uh, put these forwards program or put these forward programs forward? <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm going to answer that, but then I'm going to tee up Sarah because um, she has an actual policy. I have a guideline and those words matter. For, unfortunately, um, there's no teeth behind our guideline. Now, that said, it has been an unbelievable starting point to formally put uh, those into the template for every single RFP that we do. We're now um doing the same thing on our value analysis side. So every new product is going to have to go through and answer those questions. Um, but the next step is really to go towards a policy. Um, so I'd love to kick it over to Sarah to talk about their actual policy and how helpful that's been for driving the work. Sarah, yeah, if you can just say a few words about how you've used policy as a starting point to help further reuse goals. Yeah, I think our, our policy, you know, really provides the structural support. Um, I think, you know, one of the challenges that we've faced, I think that is unique to the health system as opposed to the campuses, um, you know, and, and institutions of higher ed is the really unique and complex regulatory environment that we're operating within. Um, and, you know, our, our, for um, you know, tenant being patient safety and um, you know providing uh, the best care possible for our patients, and so um, the the policy has really been um, great for us to provide that you know backup, I guess that we need if we need it and as we need it. And I think the targets are really useful for us in benchmarking kind of where we are with our sister health system locations sharing best practices with each other and then advancing towards that goal. So it's providing really clear targets for us. Um, and then some of the policy language, as I mentioned, towards reprocessing that's fairly new is just, I think, going to give us that additional boost for, um, as Lauren mentioned, the, the handcuffs and, and con contract language um, that, that tied to OEM contracts. It's really going to push our procurement teams to be able to have that policy backing um, in renegotiating some of those contracts in favor of reprocessing that might be hindering um, the efforts for rollout um, in certain areas now. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, we, we are at the end of our time and I, I want to respect everybody's time. And um, so before we go, I just want to make a, give a couple shout outs. Um, on our end, let me pull up the screen share again. Um, so first, um, uh, I just want to point out, we're gonna be following up today's program um, with one next month. This could be a somewhat different format, but on the same theme of healthcare, and we're gonna be inviting Erica to, to join us again. This is gonna be more of, uh, of an open uh, open floor uh, for, for discussion. Um, uh, we're sort of thinking of this as um, an, an ask the expert or sort of like office hours. And the idea is that, uh, the attendees who come along who are interested can um, give us, you know, if they have questions they would like to address up front, put that into your registration. But uh, Erica will be available to actually respond to questions directly, and you'll have the ability um, to actually speak with Erica. And, and so if there's a, a challenge, something you're trying to solve on your campus or your your um, your facility around um, healthcare waste or procurement, um, uh, that'll be a chance to actually engage with Erica live and um and for those who just want to listen to the conversation and, and hear about how others are you know some of the challenges they're facing and how they're addressing them um that's an opportunity just to sit in and listen to the conversation so that will be on uh february 21st um you can use this qr to register and it will be sending out information about this um after the program as well um want to point out that uh, we'll have the recording as well as the slides from today's program will be posted online in the next day or so. Um, we'll also have a lot of these links that um, and resources that we've been putting into the chat throughout the program from each of the presentations. We'll have those um, those those links also up on the website that you can access after the program. Um, and also, I, I mentioned at the beginning that 
of the webinar that we did a program in 2021 with some case studies from uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Vancouver Waste uh, Waste Prevention. Um, some we we had a um, we had a deep dive into some waste composition studies about uh, healthcare. All of those are available. Um, that, that recording and those resources are also available on our websites that you can get through uh, this link or or the QR code there on your screen. And um, would also point out again, we do these programs on a roughly bi-monthly uh, basis and, and all of our recordings and presentations on a whole range of topics, all tying into waste um, and procurement in some form um, are also available on our website. I encourage folks to check that out. Um, and then I, I wanna uh, give a shout out for this other conference that's coming up. This is one that I've been involved with in the planning, but the uh, the Virtual National Recycling Congress uh, originally had been planned for last December, and that's now been reset for this coming March. Um, this is gonna be a great opportunity to learn about a whole range of topics, um, not just um, uh, you know, both circular economy, um, not just recycling, but other aspects of reuse, um, uh, environmental social justice, um, extended producer responsibility. This is um, if, if you're involved in the waste industry um, and, and interested to get some national level uh, content from speakers uh, from the White House and, and the US EPA, among others, uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, sort of get national level um, expertise without the travel budget. So I encourage folks to check this out coming up in March. Um, and finally, just want to give a, a, a thank you again to, um, to Erica, Sarah, Victor, and Lauren uh, for uh, taking the time to present for us today. This has been fantastic um, and really appreciate the work that you guys are doing and, and just the leadership showing the path forward. So uh, thank you again. Um, Last thing I'll just point out is uh, we will be sending out a um, an email after the program um, or it may pop up in your screen with the survey. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Uh, we'd love to share comments um, with, with the presenter. So just look for that. And then very last thing I'm, I'll point out is um, usually with our programs, we end off with a product demo. Um, if you're not familiar with Bush Systems, we are a, a manufacturer um, and retailer of waste and recycling bins of different types. Um, uh, we don't have a product demo today, but I do want to just give a shout out for my colleague, Michelle Dunn, who um, handles all sales for the healthcare sector. Um, we have a, obviously a wide range of, of bins. Um, we, we try to you know, keep an editorial firewall with, with um, our programming, but, um, but we do, um, you know, it, the, the products are what supports this webinar series. So I encourage you to check out what we have to offer and, and reach out to my colleague. Thank you everybody for showing up and uh, we look forward to next time around. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.